We were on the road returning from Dallas. My wife and I had gone, well, we were engaged at the time. My fiance and I had gone over to Dallas to visit a friend of hers, and we were driving back. And about an hour into the trip, I was getting a little tired, and she said, would, would you like to lay down and, and I'll drive? And I said, that'd be great. I had just gotten my first iPhone, and so I plugged the iPhone into the car speaker system, listened to music, it was wonderful. I laid back, my wife was driving. I drifted softly to sleep. What felt like 30 seconds later, I awoke in a panic. Because in the way that my lovely fiance hit the brakes, I thought for sure we were headed for an 18-car pileup. And to my amazement, I looked around, and there was no one around us. And I said, what are you doing? And she said, I realized I was going a little too fast. I'm like, what? <laughs> and that's the moment I realized that my wife is a very beautiful woman. She's a fantastic woman. She's one of the kind, she is the kindest person I know. She's one of the most loving people I've ever met. She cooks a mean steak. She won't tell you this, but she cooks just a mean steak. She is a terrible driver. <laughs> Absolutely terrible. And I'm like, and, and understand, it's not her fault. It really isn't. It's in her DNA. Her mother, I've never, never been in her mother's car where the brakes don't squeal. I mean, it doesn't matter. It can be a brand new car. And a week after Brooke's mom drives it, the brakes are shot because they've never learned that you can ease. You can ease on the brakes, all right? You don't have to slam your foot on the brakes as though you're trying to go through the floor of the car. And that's still something my wife has not been able to, to fathom. And so I love her dearly, but I don't like to ride with her. Just because she's not a good driver. And she looks over at me and she says, it's fine, I got this, go to sleep. And I'm like, there's not a chance. There's not a chance I can go to sleep. I'm like, we need gas, just pull off. And so we pull off and I fill up the car with gas and I'm like, I'll drive. She's like, why, you're tired. I'm like, not anymore, I'm not. I got this. I was scared for my life because she is just a horrible driver, just a horrible driver. And there was no way I was going to be able to sleep knowing that my life was in imminent danger with my wife driving. And so I drove the rest of the way. They say life is precious, that each day is a gift. They say life is a lesson, each day is an opportunity. They say life isn't fair, that each day will bring trouble. They say life is for the living, that each day should be conquered. They say life is what you make it each day for you to define. They say life is short, each day the chance to be your last. They say life is what happens while you're busy making other plans, each day a chance to change your destiny. And over the next few weeks, we're going to look at life. We're going to look at the process that that all of us will experience. We're going to look at various aspects of life and the stages of life. But before we do any of that, today we need to start with this foundational truth. And we need to understand something. And that is that life is significant. Life is significant. Your life is significant. Whether you realize it or not, you matter. You have incredible significance and this morning, we're going to discover that. So if you have your Bible apps, you can follow along with us under the events section. Otherwise, you can follow along on the screens. My name is Brian. Thanks so much for being here. We're really excited that you're here at Lakeside Community Church. And this morning, we're going to dive into Luke 12, beginning in verse 4, with Jesus speaking when we read these words. I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who killed the body. And after that, have nothing more they can do. I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who killed the body, and after that, have nothing more that they can do. The reality is this, that some people never really live because they're constantly scared of dying. Some people never really experience life because they're constantly worried about dying. 
And as we begin to look at life and as we look at the significance of life, we have to look at these words of Jesus. And the the words of Jesus say this, don't fear, don't fear this. I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body and after that have nothing more they can do. Live without fear. I have a friend, she's single, she lives alone. And every time she hears a creak in the house, and we've all heard creaks in the house, right? We're just convinced, all right, somebody is in here. This is where I die, right here, right now. She's decided, every time she hears a creak in the house, she sits up in her bed and just screams, kill me quickly! (laughs) That's her approach. And then she waits. And listens if there's any more footsteps or anything else. But that's just what, anytime there's a creek in the house. My wife and I just moved into, the house, into a house a, a few weeks ago. And I was over one night painting. And I had headphones in. I was listening to a podcast. Why? I'm not really sure because I was the only person in the house. But I had headphones in. I was listening to a podcast. I was doing some painting. And all of a sudden I heard this noise. And I'm like, all right. It's on. (laughs) Now, I've never been trained in self-defense. I'm just counting on the fact that I have a blind rage, and unless it's my time, I'm not going to go. And if it's my time, well, God knew about this in advance. So, all right. But I'm going to go down swinging. And I hear this noise, and it's coming from behind me. And I've watched too many movies. I've watched too much 24. I'm not a governmental agent, all right? I'm not a CIA operative. I don't know any secrets about the NSA or the FBI. I'm I'm not a very political person. I I really have no value, whether whether it's like, (laughs) whether it's the Chinese or the Russians or what, or the Canadians, I don't know, whoever. I have no, like literally, no value to any foreign government whatsoever. But I'm like, Oh, yeah, there's a trained operative in this house ready to kill me. I'm like, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be my Jack Bauer. I'm going to go off like Kiefer. And then I'm like, I don't have a gun on me. All right, I'm going off like MacGyver, all right, because MacGyver never had a gun. And for those of you who don't know who MacGyver is, there's some great rerun channels you can find when you use antennas. They're available on there. Watch some MacGyver reruns. Great. And I'm like, all right. I'm going to take down a small army with just my fists, even though I've never been trained in self-defense. I got this. I can disarm a small army. But I hear this noise, and it's getting louder, and it's getting louder, and it's right behind me. And so I ball my fist up, and I turn around, and I swing my fist, and I realize it's the ice maker in our fridge. (laughs) And I almost threw my shoulder out, all because I was freaking out about a refrigerator making ice. We've all been there when we hear the creak, when that initial fear sets in. And Jesus says, don't fear that. Don't fear that. But then he continues in verse 5. He says, but I will warn you whom to fear. Fear him who after he has killed has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, Fear him. So what we have to understand here are a couple things. Number one, we were all created to outlive our lives. We were all created to outlive our lives. Death is not our destination. All of us were created to outlive our lives. And then we encounter a much bigger problem here. We encounter a question that has been asked for ages. That many who don't know God ask. That many who know God wrestle with and struggle with. And the question is this, that we must confront. The question is this, is how can a good God, how can a good God have a place like hell exist? How can a good God make and and have such a place as hell. And we really struggle with this. If God is loving, where is this divorce and his loving nature and this destination of hell? How does this work? How could this possibly be? 
And I want you to know, if you wrestle with this, if you struggle with this, you're not alone. That's not uncommon. And God's not repelled by your struggle. God's not repelled by your question. God, God isn't scared. But we have to understand that when we look at the teachings of Jesus, hell is a place that he discussed. And here, not only is hell a place that he's discussing, but he's saying, if there's anything that you should fear, it's this. And so how do we overcome this idea that a good, loving God can exist with a place like hell? And I go back to my sophomore year in college when I took a walk with a friend of mine. And in painful detail, she recounted how just weeks before she had been victimized and she had been raped. And how charges weren't going to be filed. There would be no justice. And here was someone I cared very deeply about, a good friend of mine, who's recounting for me the horror that she had experienced and all the things that she was struggling with emotionally and physically and psychologically as a result of that and how it was unfair. And I wanted justice. Most of us don't struggle with the concept of hell when we think about situations like that. When we think about terrorists. When we think about people who commit horrific acts that we don't want to fathom, that we don't even want to speak of. Most of us can somewhat wrap our minds around hell when we talk about that. The struggle for most of us when we think about this concept and this idea of hell is similar to this. We want justice when we're the victim. But what about justice for the people that we've victimized? when we place ourselves in the shoes of the victim. We long for justice. We pray for justice. We desire justice. And yet, when we put our shoes in those, when we put ourselves in the shoes of those we victimized, suddenly that longing for justice disappears. C.S. Lewis said there are two kinds of people. People who say, God, your will be done. And people to whom God says, your will be done. And when we talk about hell, what we're talking about is a place where God's nature is veiled. And if we look at this idea and we say, how can a loving God send people to hell? Well, we also have to understand this, that each and every one of us has a choice to make. And the choice we have to make is whether or not we want to follow after God. That's the choice that is available to every single one of us. And that is something that God has given all of us in free will. That God does not demand that we follow after him. And so if we reject God, and we choose not to follow after God, then hell is a place that we spend our destiny in an environment where we live out that choice, that we made the choice not to have God be a part of us. And that's the destination. And then Jesus continues. In verse 6, he says, Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And not one of them is forgotten before God. 
So he just says, don't fear somebody who can kill you. Instead, fear the one who can throw you into hell after you've been killed. And then the very next breath, he says, aren't five sparrows sold for two pennies? What? Jesus, you're a great communicator, but what are you doing here? ADD, what's, what's going on here? Where, where, are we, where are we going? And Jesus same, seems to change topics abruptly when he talks about this five sparrows for two pennies. Now, I know you can't buy five sparrows for two pennies anymore, and, and really, why would you want to? I was traveling on S just a couple weeks ago, traveling north up to Sturgeon Bay. I am not, I'm not a car guy. There was a 2018 red Corvette in front of me. I am not a car guy. I wanted that car. <laughs> like cars, meh, whatever. That car was like, that's incredible. And so, as you would expect, they were doing about 55. And I, of course, was doing just about 55 right behind them. And we traveled. And then we got to a truck in a place that we couldn't pass. And then the truck turned off right after J. I think it's on double O. I'm not sure. And then the Corvette hits the gas. And believe it or not, they went a little faster than my four-cylinder 2010 two-door Honda Civic. And then they slam on the brakes. And so I get up, and they're, they're not moving anywhere. And I'm like, certainly they're not going to challenge me to a race on S. <laughs> I'm like, what are they doing? And I look out, and there are two chipmunks in the road who are drunk. <laughs> they are, they, it looks like you're playing pinball. They're just running back and forth between the lanes. And I'm thinking, you idiots! You were willing to wreck a $60,000 Corvette for two chipmunks that probably have rabies? What is wrong with you? And we just sat there. And if you subscribe to PETA, go get a coffee for just a second. But I'm hitting my horn like, come on, let's go. They're just chipmunks with rabies. They're everywhere. That's what Jesus is talking about here when he says, you can get five sparrows for two pennies. They're everywhere. They're not worth that much. They're in, what, two pennies, that's nothing. There's an abundance of these things. And then Jesus continues. Why, even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not. You are of more value than many sparrows. See, these sparrows, those chipmunks, they aren't, a, they aren't invisible to God. And then he says, even the hairs on your head are all numbered. Now, for some of us, that is incredible. For some of us, like Greg Tedke, yeah, that's not that hard, all right? But for some of us, for some of us, this is really incredible. That God knows the numbers of hairs on our head. This is how much value you have. This is how much worth you have before God. That the hair on your head is numbered. You may feel isolated and you may feel alone. And I want you to know something. God knows how many hairs you have on your head. You may have been rejected. You may have been told all your life that you're not good enough and you won't measure up and you won't amount to much. I want you to know something. Your creator knows how many hairs are on your head. God watches the sparrows. God watches the stupid geese that poop all over our parking lot and we really wish would just go away. But God watches over them. He watches over the chipmunks that some insane guy driving a $60,000 Corvette was willing to wreck his car over. God knows how many hairs are on your head. 
Don't you ever question whether or not you matter. Don't you ever question whether or not you're significant. Don't you ever question whether or not you have purpose. Don't you ever question whether or not there's a plan for you. Your creator knows how many hairs are on your head. That's how invested he is in your life. That's the love that he has for you. But the creator of this entire world looks down on me and on you. And isn't just aware of us, but is intimately aware of every detail of our existence. That's the God that created us. That's the significance of your life. That God is so invested in your life that he knows intimately every single detail. And what's more, not only does God know every single detail of our life, but the message of Jesus is not one of fear, but of freedom for fear. He says, don't fear the one who can murder you. Don't fear the one who can kill you. Fear the one who, after you're murdered, can throw you into hell. But oh, by the way, you can buy five sparrows for two pennies. But God watches over them. And how much more does God care about you that the very number of your hairs are counted? See, the message of Jesus is not one of fear, but it's a freedom from fear. That the God who created us loves us in spite of our rebellion, in spite of our mistakes, in spite of our sin, in spite of our shortcomings, in spite of all the things that we've done wrong. God loves us anyway so much that he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross to pay the price for all of those that we have victimized, to pay the price for all of the things that I have done wrong. God sent his son to pay for my mistakes. And he loves me. And he cares about me. And he cares about every small detail. Every tiny one. Some of you right now, you're going through a really rough season. And it seems like God is just so distant. Like he can't be found. And I want you to know that none of these details catch God by surprise. And he cares about every single one. Some of you right now are facing medical diagnoses that scare you and they frighten you. And I want you to know that God knows and he cares. Some of you right now face a really big choice about your employment. And you're wrestling and you're like, does it even matter? And I want you to know that yes, it matters. Yes, it matters to God because God cares about every single detail in your life. Some of you struggle with the words that you were told, the message that you heard repeatedly from the time you were growing up, from your parents and people who should have been friends but weren't really, and the messages, as try, the best you try to just place them out of your mind, they just keep coming back in, and they cycle on repeat, and you just shake your head, and you can't get the voices to go away, and in the quietness of every moment, they remind you of every mistake. And they cause you to question. Am I enough? Will I ever be good enough? Some of you right now are living in depression because you put these dreams out for your life and you've, 
you've been incredibly ambitious, and yet your dreams haven't come true. And truth be told, you're doing some incredible things. It just looks differently than what you thought it would. And you haven't given yourself the freedom to accept that. And you just keep beating yourself up. Here's the deal. God cares about you. God cares about every detail in your life. And God loves you. You matter. You have a purpose. You have significance. And the worth that you have is demonstrated by the fact that, yes, God knows how many hairs are on your head, but it's also demonstrated in the fact that God sent His Son to be our rescue, to be our redemption. To deliver us from the consequences of our mistakes, of our shortcomings, of our sin. So that we could walk through life without fear. God paid that price. And the Bible says that if we would recognize who Jesus is and give him our lives, that he will save us. That we will be free from fear. And we will escape the penalty that we all deserve. And in just a few minutes, we're going to go down to the lake. And we are going to celebrate with four people who made, all made the decision to follow Jesus. They've all made the decision to give their lives to him. And we're going to celebrate the next step of that journey when we baptize them with the beautiful picture of what Jesus did for us, that he died on the cross, he was buried, and three days later he rose again, and the beautiful picture of what God does in us at the moment we make the decision to follow Jesus. And that's to make us brand new. You matter. You matter to God. You are significant. God loves you. He is intimately aware of who you are. God, I pray that you'd help us understand your love for us. I pray you would help us understand just how much we matter. Thank you for being a God who's not distant. Thank you for being a God who's not far. Thank you for being a God who loves us and who is aware of every detail. God, thank you for allowing us to live without fear. Thank you for giving us the choice. So God, I pray for anybody here who hasn't made this decision and I pray, God, that they would just understand the incredible love that you have for them. I pray, God, that they would get a taste of what it's like to live a life without fear because of who you are and what you've done. I pray for the person who's here and who's questioning, do I matter? And I pray, God, that you would just help them see how much they matter. And God, we celebrate the fact that we're going down to the lake and the beautiful picture of what you've done. So God, we're asking, keep changing lives and let us at Lakeside keep being a part for your glory. In your son, Jesus.